Everyday Samurai, Episode 25. Greetings, friends, and welcome to Everyday Samurai, in service to your liberty and the security of a free state. Welcome indeed. How are you? At the time of this recording, it is now January of 2019, and a new year has begun. Like most everything, there is simultaneously both great potential and wonderful things happening. Yet also tragedies unfolding and ominous signs portend great challenges for the future. For instance, the first murder of 2019 occurred just 12 minutes into the new year in Philadelphia. This follows one of the most deadly years for that city as 2018 saw 351 murders with 18 of them occurring before midnight on December 31st. It is likely that the first death of 2019, again just 12 minutes past midnight, was also connected to the others that took place the night before. But no suspects or motives have been as of yet named. The Philadelphia police did, however, state that drugs were the primary motive for the recent uptick in murder specifically citing the potency and availability of opioids as fueling violent competition over territory among rival dealers. As someone who dedicated a lot of time and resources to the supposed war on drugs, I have a lot to say about these issues, but I'll set that aside for now simply to point out that there is nothing new here. Just a quick internet search revealed a story from the year 2000 describing a drug-related mass killing and 420 homicides in 1997. And true to form, back then the politicians and bureaucrats were scapegoating responsibility for the problems while looking to infringe even more upon individual rights, citing lax gun laws for the high homicide rate. In previous episodes, we described what I call the ruler's dilemma, in which those in power need to constantly gain control and decision-making authority over more resources in order to buy popular support. This means that they must make some people worse off, meaning take away their resources and freedom, in order to make those the political actor believes will best support them in maintaining their position. If you look at any point in history, you'll find kings, courtiers, politicians, administrators, or bureaucrats always dealing with tragedies using a similar refrain. That is, a call for more money, more manpower, and more authority to deal with the problem. Politicians know, as you may be familiar, that you should never let a crisis go to waste. I actually found one website claiming that former President John F. Kennedy during a speech in 1959 used a phrase also spread by many success coaches nowadays that the kanji or Chinese characters used for the word crisis is composed of danger and opportunity. There is some truth to the interpretation. The first character indeed is abunai, the Japanese word for dangerous, and the second character is hata, which means machine, mechanism, occasion, or opportunity. Taken together, they read as onyomi, or the Japanese rendering of the imported Chinese pronunciation as kiki, meaning crisis political leaders actually thrive during times of crisis because that is when they can most readily commandeer resources from the population and activate new authorities with majority support. In this way, they truly do never let a crisis go to waste. And that is also why, for the best of intentions, the United States Constitution vested the Congress with the power to judge when war is justified because executive agents are predisposed to exploit crisis for their own benefit. With this in mind, our experience of current events only reminds us of just how important having more people steeped in the principles of martial art and political economy are for navigating the way ahead, not only for ourselves, but for those we care about and those we consider our countrymen. Do you see that your training in martial arts is connected in a way much bigger than just mere self-defense? Do you keep this in mind when going about your daily activities? This kind of thinking can also be instrumental in harnessing the power of now, staying fully present in the now moment, and aware of your environment, your state of being, which includes your physical readiness and tools available to you, is the greatest way to sense potential threats before they become acute. A lot goes into your ability to stay present, not the least of which is your physiology. Adequate rest, proper nutrition, sufficient exercise, hydration, and right mindset are also key factors in your ability to remain focused. 
And this applies to whatever you want to achieve in life, not the least of which is maintaining yourself as a force in being. Perhaps you can see that situational awareness, as I'm describing it, has two components, the physical and the mental. In actuality, the body and mind are not separate phenomena, but a unified system constantly operating in unison. Cognitive ability, your capacity to think and reason, is heavily impacted by the state of your physical condition. Similarly, the perception of your physical state is filtered through your mind. Various techniques, including neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, teach how to change your physical state by way of self-talk, affirmation, and deliberate decision. As Napoleon Hill and Clement Stone simply stated in their book Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, if you have to have more energy, be more energetic. You can do this by adopting a do-it-now mantra. It doesn't necessarily require that you follow every impulse that pops into your mind, but it instills greater awareness of the range of choices available to you, thereby allowing for greater discernment in how you direct your time, which is also a finite resource. Choosing to be more situationally aware and thereby averting danger or deterring aggression at the earliest stages requires full engagement of the body-mind system. Just as we cannot expect elite performance on day one at the gym or in the dojo, we have to make daily training part of our daily routine, part of our normal operations. In other words, we have to make our everyday walk the warrior's walk. To get the body ready for the day's challenges, I suggest the progressive yoga program at everydaysamurai.life forward slash progress. You'll strengthen and limber up your body while shredding fat in as little as 20 minutes. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash progress. To prepare the mind for greater situational awareness, I suggest clearing away mental chatter through meditation. 12 minutes a day is enough when you leverage powerful meditation technology, and you can do that through the Zen 12 program at everydaysamurai.life forward slash Zen 12. No more guessing if you're meditating correctly. You can get all the benefits of a trained monk when you meditate with Zen 12. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash Zen 12. So now that you have your body-mind system fully present and situationally aware, you're in a relaxed, responsive state where you notice potential threats early in the attack cycle and are thereby well positioned to disrupt an enemy's harmful designs. It may be adjusting your position within space, you might even leave the area, or you can engage verbally, asking questions are a great way to send someone through their decision cycle, thereby buying time for you to seize the initiative. You could employ a tool, call for help, or put a barrier between you and the danger. All of these options flow from situational awareness. Situational awareness also requires comprehending the true nature of physical altercations in the real world. This is where martial art must separate from sport fighting. Martial art, as you'll recall from our previous episodes, which I encourage you to go back and listen to, is at essence the vehicle of self-governance, the physical means of upholding the law. Again, real law, scientific law, is very simple. Do all you have agreed to do and do not encroach upon other people or their property. With this, we have the basis of contract and criminal law. Using private property as the unit of analysis, we have a clear boundary signal when a transgression of the law has occurred. Law is universal. It applies to everyone at all times, thereby fulfilling the need for equality under the law. No exceptions for anyone, including and especially political office holders. The law is applicable within a commonwealth composed of those individuals holding some common affinity and contracting among one another for mutual security. And the law also equally applies to foreign policy to prevent incursions from outsiders. Under law, rights are understood as the absence of infringements upon people or their property. And individuals are free to positively act in pursuit of their perceived benefit, so long as their actions do not encroach upon others. In this way, equal liberty forms the proper restraint upon individual behavior. Liberty under law is simultaneously innovative and conservative. In a free society, people are ever striving to increase their well-being through trade, production, experimentation, and entrepreneurship, yet are rightly informed of these limits through strict liability, property boundaries, the need to reach agreement with others in order to access resources and the readiness of others to rebuke encroachment, using force if necessary. 
Whenever a monopoly on the use of force occurs, such as in the modern nation-state, distortions to scientific law, most notably the infringement upon private property and the right to use force to uphold property boundaries, yield distortions to natural order. Perverse consequences inevitably occur. As martial artists and political economists, we can notice these perversions unfolding as disrespect for private property attends the centralization of the use of force. People are less secure in their property, and the state infringes upon their ability to repel invasions. Take, for instance, one of the first murders of 2019 to occur in the United Kingdom. In the Mayfair section of London, England, at approximately 05.30 a.m. on the 1st of January, a security guard was stabbed in the chest while trying to repel a group of gatecrashers trying to gain entrance to a luxury apartment hosting a New Year's Eve party. He was attacked after rushing from the inside of the building to the aid of the other bouncers who were embroiled in a fight with the gatecrashers outside. Video footage shows Tudor Simeonov, a 33-year-old Romanian who had immigrated to England just a few months ago, blocking the assailant's entrance to the venue and throwing punches as the gang attempted to break into the 5,000-pound-a-week townhouse overlooking Hyde Park. One of the other bouncers reported that he had only been out there for about 30 seconds when he was stabbed in the middle of the chest. The colleague said, quote, He never said a word to me. I think he was in shock. He only survived for about a minute. He died in front of me with his eyes open, staring at me. Close quote. This is the reality of the world in 2019. People uninvited to a party are willing to kill a bouncer with a knife. This is how quickly the experience of life can turn into death. Can you imagine what it's like to rush out and do your job only to assist your colleagues and in 30 seconds find yourself mortally wounded? This is why martial art training needs to ever bear in mind Sun Tzu's words from the art of war. It is the way of life and death, the ground of extinction or survival. The kind of martial art that allows for the maintenance of law, the protection of private property that is so essential to human flourishing, needs to be distinguished from sport fighting. These questions have dwelled within the martial community for quite a while. Borrowing from Japan's Ultimate Martial Art by Daryl Max Craig, we see how jiu-jitsu evolved into a popular sport known as judo. Open quote. Ju meaning gentle and do meaning way. Basically, jiu-jitsu or techniques of combat have been converted into judo or techniques of sport. In February 1882 at a Buddhist temple called Ye Shoji, in a small room of only 12 tatami mats, 18 feet by 12 feet, and with only a few dedicated onlookers, birth was given to what we now know as judo. A few years later, on June 10, 1886, in a large, well-lit 100 tatami room at Tokyo Police Headquarters, a contest took place between the new and the old. Jiu-jitsu was represented by the head instructor at the Japanese Police Department. Judo was represented by a student of Dr. Kano. The student was also an Aiki Jiu-Jitsu master. The Jiu-Jitsu master was beaten and died. From that day forward, Judo was the only hand-to-hand -hand self-defense art the upper class would respect and accept. The lower class, trying to copy the upper, followed suit. As a consequence, Jiu-Jitsu was left to decay as a relic of the past. Close quote. I know there is some controversy about what actually happened during the series of matches that day or whether someone actually died. I'll set that aside for now and focus on the fact that the sport became more popular. It is easy to see why this would happen when examining the incentive structure like good political economists do. Sports are more attractive to spectators, sponsors, young and old, strong or infirm alike. Sport fighting is more dynamic and exciting to be a part of. Combat training is by its very nature boring to watch and restrictive since significant rules need to be in place to prevent injury. Remember, the purpose of martial art is to preserve life, liberty, and property, even if that means violently rebuking transgressors. The martial practitioner is not interested in winning a contest or putting on a good show. The objective is securing all that is placed under our care, knowing that the consequences are life or death. The Samurai traditions referred to this as Shinken Shobu, literally translated as real blade, victory or defeat. Interestingly, the last kanji in Shinken Shobu is also pronounced makeru or makasu, which also means to assume responsibility. 
It's another way of appreciating how having skin in the game of life or death changes behavior drastically. Exploring these deeper nuances of samurai terminology is another reason why studying Japanese is so much fun and essential for the martial practitioner. I recommend you look into rocket languages to get started on learning the language of your choice at everydaysamurai.life forward slash rocket. Assuming that every potential opponent is or at least could be armed radically alters the underlying assumptions of martial training. A young judo practitioner who started training in Aikibudo under Aikido founder Ueshiba Morihei sensei explored these concepts as well. His name was Kenji Tomiki, and he wrote a letter in 1928 in which he questioned his former sport-oriented training in light of the Aiki Jujutsu he was learning. It is also informative that he was in the Japanese Imperial Army at the time and was involved in preparations for the invasion of Manchuria. I'll now read from the letter translated by Fumiaki Shishida of Waseda University and found on the Aikido Sangen Kai website. I'll also post a link in the show notes, so be sure to check out everydaysamurai.life forward slash 25. Open quote. Dear Sir, I have not been able to send greetings for some time. I know that you and your wife have passed the time without difficulties, and I myself am still serving robustly in my employment by the army. The unusual heat wave that has been continuing in this area through the summer has gradually given way to autumn breezes, and we can feel the chill in the mornings and evenings. We will be dispatched to this year's special war games that were moved up from the state ceremony to be held in the beginning of next month nearby Morioka, and fortunately we have been granted the honor of participating. I am attached to the headquarters for the 31st Regiment, 6th Battalion, and will be departing 21 days from tomorrow. We will start with combined arms training near Aomori, and brigade and regiment level opposition. Then, directly after that, proceed with provisional division opponents and finish with the Shinkyo large-scale maneuvers. Only a month after the war games are completed, I will be separating from life in the military. After my military discharge, it seems that I will be returning to Tokyo to become a burden upon everybody once more. The other day I received a letter from Ueshiba-sensei. He has returned to Ayabe for a short time and will be returning to Tokyo in September. I was certainly happy to know that all of you are researching as usual, and that the number of enthusiastic practitioners grows with each passing day. Looking back to last spring when I first received instruction from Ueshiba Sensei, and the short period until my enlistment, a few months after that, those were truly days that held great significance to me. In addition to an extraordinary revolution in my outlook on Judo, which I had researched for more than 10 years since my elementary school days, the instruction and insight that I received into many of the questions and dissatisfactions with Judo that I had felt until that time clarified my thoughts on the current situation of Kodokan Judo. Of course, the number of days that I had been able to learn Jiu-Jitsu from my instructor were limited, and even now I am still far from being able to plumb the depths of the deeper techniques. However, and this is based on the research of a short time, here are some of the things that I have been taught up until this time or that have been wandering through my thoughts, with the knowledge that I have much more to be taught in the future. Firstly, I have thought a great deal up to this point concerning what is called the Judo philosophy. I was unable to understand Judo's place in the midst of the greater meaning of Budo, but now I have come to believe that this is clearly so, that is, it is not that I was completely denying Kano-sensei's philosophy of Judo, but that there are some questions concerning the presuppositions. Is the single path of Judo included in the greater meaning of Budo? If that is so, then there is no particular need for argumentation from the viewpoint of Judo. Perhaps it is not that traditional Kendo, Judo, and other Bujutsu formed as individual entities with individual viewpoints. This is what I was taught. What is called Budo is a single integrated path, and this path is now expressed in an unbroken form as Kenjutsu, Sojutsu, the Buge, Juhapan, and note that there are 18 traditional types of martial arts used by samurai in Tokugawa, Japan. In past times, all Bujutsu was, in the end, the manifestation of a unique path of war. Therefore, both Kenjutsu and Jujutsu return, in the end, to a single path. And it is not necessary to divide Kendo and Judo, 
in order to explain them. Actions of advance and retreat, body posture, breathing, they all must match with each other. However, the judo and kendo of the present day are virtually all in the process of becoming increasingly different from each other. Judo is not the same as something in which one holds a weapon, but both of those arts must adhere to the same basic principles. I gave myself up to the clarity of this truth through Ueshiba Sensei's Jujutsu. In the ideal Budo, as one progresses along the path, their technical side progresses in parallel. This varies from what occurs in sports. In comparison to sports, in which records are maintained for the few years of one's youth in the sport, in Budo there comes a gradual increase in skill that accompanies mental conditioning continuing to old age. If we are looking towards this as an ideal, then there are a plethora of questions that arise concerning current Kodokan Judo. If we instead consider the case of Kendo, there are many practitioners who have the spirit to keep striving vibrantly past their 60s, a better match with the ideals of Budo. These weaknesses have all been resolved by Ueshiba Sensei's Jujutsu. It can be thought that Kodokan Ryu only hopes for growth within an extremely limited area. Therefore, with the drawbacks caused by the introduction of things such as modern boxing and karate, it can be felt that it has reached a practical dead end in modern times. If that is so, then from where do these weaknesses emerge? In the end, I think that it returns to the fact that the current Kodokan Ryu has grown based upon games for physical education rather than self-defense techniques. In that lies a great deal of error. This can be understood through research into the origins of Jujutsu and the sources behind the establishment of Kano Sensei's Kodokan Judo. In the past, the general Jujutsu, which has since divided into many different schools, was all for the purpose of Shinken Shobu, or a match with a live blade, in other words, a fight that determines life or death. From those Yuha, various schools that focused on throwing techniques such as Kito Ryu and Yoshin Ryu, or those which specialized in striking, atemi, and holds such as Tenjin Shinryo Ryu and Yoshin Ryu differentiated themselves. However, the long and short of it is that defense against attacks was the primary focus, so that joint techniques were the most common. Consequently, Kano Sensei removed the joint techniques from those schools avoiding striking, chose the least dangerous strategies, and established a Kodokan Judo that was appropriate for modern times. Then a variety of competitive methods were established from the most interesting principles and finally we have what is thriving today. On the other hand, it ended up as being completely a sport. Ueshiba Sensei would often say, Are things like Kodokan Judo useful? That's not real Bujitsu. And actually, the reality is just that. Looked at from the viewpoint of self-defense, it's completely powerless. And then, looking at from the viewpoint of true Bujitsu, it's at the point of heresy. However, if one looks at it from the viewpoint of sport, then I think that it functions very well. I believe that here are the current reasons for modern judo. So in the end, the problem must become which reason for judo's existence is most common in modern times, as self-defense or as a sport. Putting this problem aside for the moment, I would like to talk just a little about clarifying another side of the problem, the start and end of the controversy that engendered the Kodokan method of competition. In former years, there were rival judo matches between Senior Daiichi High School and Senior Daini High School. As a result, although Daiichi High School had a leading third don and a number of black belts, Daini High School, who never had more than one or two black belts, would place higher in the competitions. What it came back to is that Daini High School trained thoroughly in ground techniques, so Daiichi High School had no space in which to attack them. Kano Sensei was extremely critical, stating, The foundation of Judo is Shinken Shobu. In times past, ground techniques were used after the first opponent was fully overwhelmed in order to completely control a second opponent. In comparison to those times, Dai Ni High School responds to an attack with ground techniques from the very beginning. This is not a proper thing to do for Shinken Shobu. Extremely cowardly. A great controversy grew surrounding this. We didn't like ground techniques and we felt that the behavior of Dai Ni High School was underhanded. However, in terms of theory, we knew that they were absolutely correct. That is, modern Kodokan Judo as sport. Therefore, as long as something does not violate the rules of the decided upon method of competition, the goal is to win. Things such as Shinken Shobu were outside of the equation in this case. 
Accordingly, I believe that the use of Daiichi High School's weakness in ground techniques to get the win is only reasonable. This problem of ground techniques versus standing techniques is a continuing problem, even today. And remember, this was written in 1928, how much more so in today's world dominated by MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Back to the letter. However, just delaying to a draw by responding unconsciously with ground techniques lacks an aggressive mindset. There is a great deal there that contradicts the warrior's battle-to-the-death-without-surrender attitude. Further, the fact is that one can practice throwing techniques for three or four years without developing real skill. In comparison, combining ground techniques with physical strength, one can achieve significant results in only six months or a year. So they are very effective when going into competitive matches. What is prized in paired sports is victory in competitive matches rather than shinken shobu. So if the same mental and physical conditioning, sacrifice, and effort is necessary to achieve that, then I believe that it is best for us to take the route towards ground techniques rather than throwing techniques. In the midst of those valued words from Kano-sensei that I mentioned before, modern judo is gradually developing into a sport. Furthermore, I know that there is a dilemma in its gradual separation from shinken shobu, or life and death attitude and intention. There's also a translator's note attached to the article here, stating, Jigoro Kano himself apparently had misgivings about judo as a sport, expressed here to Gunji Koizumi in 1936. Quote, I have been asked by people of various sections as to the wisdom and possibility of judo being introduced with other games and sports at the Olympic Games. My view on the matter, at present, is rather passive. If it be the desire of other member countries, I have no objection, but I do not feel inclined to take any initiative. For one thing, judo, in reality, is not a mere sport or game. I regard it as a principle of life, art, and science. In fact, it is a means for personal cultural attainment. Only one of the forms of judo training, so-called randori, or free practice, can be classed as a form of sport. Certainly, to some extent, the same may be said of boxing and fencing, but today they are practiced and conducted as sports. Then the Olympic Games are so strongly flavored with nationalism that it is possible to be influenced by it and to develop contest judo, a retrograde form as jiu-jitsu was before Kodokan judo was founded. Now returning to Tomiki's letter. The benefits that come from Kodokan judo are usually explained by the following four points. 1. Methods of physical education or taikuho. 2. Methods of cultivating the spirit, shushinho. 3. Methods of consoling the spirit, ishinho. And 4. Methods of self-defense, goshinho. The purpose of this study is to clarify the background and intent of Kano Jigoro when he introduced the concept of ishinho, methods to console the spirit, as one of the objectives of judo. Kano initially described the purposes of judo as taiku, physical education, shobu, martial arts, and shushin, to master one's spirit. Later, Kano added ishinho as an additional objective, but the reason he did so is unknown. Upon examining Kano's writings and the aspects of judo popularized during this period, I was able to clarify the following. 1. After 1883, judo penetrated schools as an extracurricular activity. Later, many judo clubs were established and they began holding inter-school matches. 2. Kano showed that people who trained in the discipline of judo reaped the benefits of physical, spiritual, and martial shobu discipline. 3. In 1911, judo became a standard subject in Japanese high schools. Later, Kano announced the inclusion of Ishin Ho as an objective of judo and added additional factors, including the pleasure of exercise, the enjoyment of watching randori, competitions, and kata, and kata as an art form to judo. 4. Kano generated a new concept of Ishin Ho against the background of his dissatisfaction with normal gymnastics, the various benefits of judo, and the merit of athletic sports. With increasing inter-school matches, Ishin Ho disappeared from Kano's works, and students became involved in many scandals. When I attempt to compare Ueshiba Sensei's Aiki Jujitsu to these points, the following thoughts arise. There is certainly a danger of harm when elementary and junior high school students train normally for competition. If the instructor exercises appropriate caution, then it can be suitable even for those who might be considered unsuitable for Kodokan Yu, such as the elderly and women. 
Therefore, I believe that on that point, or as concerns physical exercise, that it, meaning Ueshiba Aiki Jujitsu, is by no means inferior. As a Budo with a goal towards cultivating the spirit, its goals are the same. So in the end, it returns to a problem of the instructor. But I believe it to be far superior in terms of its great emphasis on spirituality. As for methods of consoling the spirit, it is said that Kotokan Ryu appeals to feelings for the fine arts, but conversely, these things can also be seen in this Aiki Jujitsu. The kamai of the legs and hips in this Jujitsu and the movement of the body matches precisely to no dance. So I think that on this point it is actually ideal. Needless to say, as a method of self-defense, there is a remarkable difference. The harm of a focus on randori is that one tends toward the few techniques that one is skilled at and strays from the path, degenerating into simple physical strength. Although that is fine in terms of physical education, in order to grasp the true spirit of bujitsu, I believe that clearly maturing the meaning of bujitsu through kata before entering into randori is the way to eliminate mistakes. In this jujitsu, the focus is on kata, but what seems to be a rather roundabout way to understand the meaning of that bujitsu is conversely a shortcut and can be thought to eliminate mistakes. However, what I think is even more superior here is that although it is called kata, it is not the same as the fixed 15 throwing kata or the joint locking kata limited to so many techniques of kotokan ryu. Now listen to this key point that Tomiki is making regarding Ueshiba Aiki Jujitsu. They are flexible and freely adaptable to whatever situation arises. They are kata that are themselves randori. When actually observing Kotokan Ryu and others and researching into their historical origins, I was able to clearly ascertain the points of superiority of this Ueshiba Ryu Aiki Jujitsu. Thus, the desire to understand the value of this Jujitsu from the wider perspective of Nihon Bujutsu has been continuously on my mind. As I said before, I have trained in Judo for many years, but in the end, I never took it a single step past the point of view as a sport, and accordingly I researched it as a superior method of physical exercise. But when I emerged from my academic studies, limits on my time, stamina, and location made me think that Judo was something that I would have to distance myself from. However, through an unexpected chance, I was able to observe Sensei's technique, meaning Ueshiba Ryu Aiki Jujitsu, and found something that I could continue to practice and improve forever as another form of exercise and a training interest. I enlisted just as I graduated last spring, and leaving my classroom and my home behind then had the time to devote myself to Sensei's instruction. I would like to return to Tokyo after my military discharge and find some employment there, but I am also hoping to be able to spend a long time on research into Jujitsu if it pleases you. Finally, there is the issue of Sensei's faith. I felt some uncertainty just as I visited Sensei in Ayabe last year. I believe that Omoto Kyo, meaning the religious sect that Ueshiba was practicing, and Bujitsu are completely separate. Perhaps due to my skeptical nature and the many subjects that I could not fully comprehend, I was unable to understand this Omoto Kyo, filled with miracles that surpass modern science. However, I have great admiration for Sensei's faith and Sensei's humble attitude. It may be that it is with faith that Bujitsu first reaches that level, that I may have been taught at a visceral level that Bujitsu Shugyo, or austere martial training, is something that, in the end, returns to faith. Tomiki then goes into his final salutations to Admiral Takeshita, and I too will offer my salutations and close with words of thanks for your being here. Thank you for sharing the show with those you believe will resonate with the message of securing a free society through the study of martial principles for the real world. That is why having a live blade, life or death approach is so essential for your understanding and training. It might not only save your life, but will also empower you and civil society to restore the blessings of liberty that are constantly under attack by aspiring tyrants. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Everyday Samurai and look forward to seeing you next time. Be sure to sign up for our emailing list at Everyday Samurai Life. Right now, I'm giving away a free ebook on building your own 72 hour survival kit, so sign up today at Everyday Samurai Life. We've also got some awesome coffee mugs, tank tops, and t shirts with our logo and a quote from Miyamoto Musashi reminding you to make your everyday walk the warrior's walk when you go to Everyday Samurai Life forward slash logo. That's Everyday Samurai Life forward slash logo. Until next time, Stay sharp.
Stay aware and be well.